Well, hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today. Um, we are gonna be talking about the return of hacktivism and more specifically, the insider. So I am JD Hansen. I've been working in security and technology for the past 17 years. I'm currently the CISO and CIO at Code42, where I'm honored to lead a really progressive and transparent security team. Um, we have a large focus on securing and driving the business forward. So Code42 is a software company. And what we do at Code42 is we develop software for security teams just like yours to use. Um, really excited to share with you today some of our learnings on this really important topic, insider risk. So Masha, I'll turn it to you. Thanks, JD. It's really a pleasure to be able to do this with you today. Uh, my name is Masha Sadova, and I am the founder of Elevate Security. And uh, my career has been focused on looking at human risk in organizations and giving tools to CISOs and security teams to be able to measure uh, the employee risk in their organization and then uh, have tools available to them to proactively secure and contextually influence employees in their, in, in their orgs to be part of the security defense. A lot of what my, my career has been focused on is knitting together the concepts of behavioral science and psychology into security, which is a theme that I'm really excited to weave into some of our conversation today. And so with that, uh, let's get started. So in the next 30 or so minutes that we have together, what JD and I are going to cover with you all is the question of well, what is insider risk? When we talk about this, what, what do we mean and ensure that we're all on the same page with a common definition? And then taking a look at uh, 2020 and understanding how all the changes that happened in that year, um, how those affected the insider threat landscape and how that looks different from years before. Uh, JD and I will walk through some recent cases in the news that are really valuable lessons for us all to learn from. And then we'll walk through a couple of examples of what you can do to help address this risk in your organization. And then a look around the corner around what's next and how you can think about uh, solving this problem going back in your, in your orgs tomorrow. So what is insider risk? Uh, one of my favorite definitions of insider risk is actually is, is this spectrum. Because when we think about insider risk, there isn't just one type of risk that exists in our organization. There are primarily two ends of the spectrum. One is malicious, and that is when an employee or contractor or some, some worker in our organizations decides to act uh, with the conscious decision to do harm. So they are, this is a knowledgeable person who is acting against the best interests of a company and knowingly trying to steal data or information or cause harm. Now on the other end, you have accidental insider risk. And quite honestly, this is the one that happens significantly more often in the landscape. And accidental is when employees who, um, maybe because they don't know better, maybe because they're distracted. Uh, there's a lot of reasons that go into this and we'll talk about a few of them, but they, they are not consciously trying to cause harm, but still do so anyway. And so in this presentation, we're actually gonna cover both types of risks and talk about which kind of insider risk we are focusing on when we give a specific example or remediation technique. You are also going to notice that we are using the term insider risk in this presentation, and that's very, very intentional. So I want to take a minute and just explain why we're not talking about DLP and we are not talking about insider threat. So first, the DLP. I think we can all agree this has been kind of a failed technology for us. Um, I can say that I am a recovering DLP user myself. Um, and so for the last six years, Gartner has been giving this same advice to customers about DLP and the advice is don't do it. Um, it's very cumbersome. It's designed to create and address a very specific compliance problem. Um, and we haven't really made the necessary changes that we need to, to meet users where they are today. DLP hasn't made that change. And so 
inter insider threat. So this term and the technology in this category were getting better, but as Masha pointed out, this term is very focused on that malicious user and we need something broader. We know that most of the data issues that we have today and most of the events that happen in our organization that cause issues are due to non malicious actions by our employees. So we need something that can move beyond that 1% of employees that is the malicious person trying to exfil data and cover visibility to all of our end users. So enter insider risk. And so insider risk, this is a category that's really focused on protecting all of your data, all of your users. And from everyday exfiltration risk, no matter intent, so no matter malicious or non-malicious. Um, insider risk is that 100% visibility that security teams are looking for. Um, and this distinction, um, though it's small, it's just a, it's a really important distinction that we want to make. So let's, let's move forward. And what I wanna do next is focus on how insider risk has changed um, and what this really means for your organizations. So this, this first screenshot here, this is from the 2019 data breach report. And you can see on the yellow line there that employee error has consistently going up year after year. Um, in 2019, employee error was in the top three sources for data breaches. Um, this is actually beating out malware. So a really important um, trend to keep our eye on. <clears throat> In this next slide, um, this is another really important stat from the data breach report. 30% of breaches are happening as a result of insider risk. Um, a lot has changed in 2020, and the increase of breaches caused by insiders has really only gone up. And so we're going to dig into a few of the reasons why, um, starting with this next slide. So the very, the very first reason, macro reason why we think insider risk is such an issue now is the fact that we're leveraging more and more collaboration technology within our organizations. There was a comment from the IDC that said adoption of collaboration technologies accelerated by almost five years just in the year 2020 um, based on what we were faced with and everybody kind of moving remote. Um, so these, these collaboration technology platforms, man, they're great, um, but they also pose a ton of risk to our company's data. Using cloud storage locations make it a lot harder to track where your data is, how your users are sharing it. One thing that I run into on a very regular basis is my users just accidentally making documents, they intend to be private, public links, um, because these platforms make it so easy to share. So certainly putting our data at a higher risk. The second reason why we believe insider risk is becoming a, a bigger issue and on the rise is employee turnover. So turnover at companies has really never been higher. Just since February, over 3 million people have left their place of employment. Um, and, and why is it such a big deal when people leave their place of employment? Um, it's a big deal because we know that when people leave companies, they take all their data with them. Uh, our latest data research report, people were asked if they took data with them when they left their employer, and 63% of people responded, yes, they did. And th these are just the people that are admitting it. We know that most people, when they leave the organization, are taking data with them. Um, not surprisingly, another reason we believe insider risk is on the rise is remote work. So remote work, it's something that has been growing in the past few years, but overnight accelerated with the impacts of COVID-19. So many of you are, are probably listening to this talk right now from home um, and you're thinking, okay, why does, what does this mean? Why does this play a role into um, the data risk? And so I'll, I'll explain it. Um, when, when we're at home, our, our data is at a, a higher degree of leaving the organization. Um, in a recent poll, 61% of security leaders told us that remote work was a contributing factor in their particular data breach. Um, and it's really not super hard to understand. So on this next slide, <clears throat> 
there, there are two important things going on here that I wanna describe related to remote work. First, employees feel as though there's less oversight when they're working from home and they're more likely to engage in a malicious action. The other thing that's going on is that we're incredibly distracted at home, especially this year with kids and family members also working at home with us. Um, I have my girls, I have my dog, my husband, we're all at home and there are endless, endless distractions. Um, I love some of these images that you see on the screen that show what it's really like working from home um, and all the distractions that come with it. So what does it mean for your company's data? Distractions lead to more and more of our employees just making mistakes. Again, not malicious mistakes, but mistakes. And these mistakes lead to unintentional data exposures for our organizations. Yeah. So when we also take a look at the reasons why data leaves our networks and put on the perspective of malicious insider threat, we can see that there's, this is one of my favorite models that explains how um, incidents like this happen. So if we take a person who has a predisposition of, of um, circumventing authority and maybe being inclined to stealing data to, to begin with, and then they have stressors in their life, sometimes financial stressors, sometimes emotional, sometimes um, mental or physical. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons why we think about stressors. Uh, we amp up a situation in which a, uh, an individual might be um, more apt to conducting what is, what is illegal or unethical actions. Now, in the moment where they may want to do so, there's a specific choice that happens they might be faced with a mitigating factor or a solution that gets them off of this track and back to a norm. And mitigating solution, uh, while that sounds maybe foreign, looks totally normal. And it's our everyday society saying, this is normal behavior that is not. And um, there are ways that we can get somebody to rethink their actions. Now, without those norms, those type of stressors can amplify and ultimately lead to concerning behavior. Now, if we take a look at the, 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 the situation that JD just talked about and we're all working from home and the circumstances of our normal work environment have totally changed, we no longer have those work norms to help us with those mitigations. So not only do we have increased stress, which I'm gonna mention in a minute, but the things that help us get back on track aren't really there. Because before, if we have some suspicious activity um, happening around us, it's a lot harder to get away with that, frankly, right? We're sharing cubicle space and uh, you can kind of see if someone is plugging in USBs where they're not supposed to occasionally, right? Or putting in laptops into a bag that they haven't taken, taken out before, right? There's more norms that we can observe and frankly, hold each other accountable to. Work from home, that doesn't exist for us. Uh, and there's a lot less people to even ask um, for help, right? Your IT department is significantly far away. There's no cube mates to say, is that a real phishing attack or not? So both unintentional uh, and malicious uh, have increased uh, chances of happening in this type of environment. And as we saw in the previous slide, not only is mitigating factors one of the components of it, but the stress and the stressors that amplify the situation. And according to the most recent Gallup report, uh, Americans are at a nine year all time low of dissatisfaction and unhappiness. And for many people, it's a different reason, but there's plenty to choose from, right? Politics, pandemics, unemployment, or social movements, there's a lot going on in everybody's life that truly increases the stress factor for every individual and as a whole, uh, our organizations, which then translates to um, more of a tinderbox as it relates to insider threat and this risk. So what we wanted to do next was dig into a few of the recent cases. Um, I'm gonna start with this first one that uh, took place at Tesla. So Tesla obviously has some really important intellectual property to protect, has some very public insider threat cases in the news. Um, in this case here outlined, an employee at Tesla certainly was on that track where they were in, um, they were passed up for getting a job promotion and 
so this was an increased stress moment in this employee's life and they chose to exfiltrate very sensitive data. So employee had a trusted access, sent a large amount of sensitive data to an unknown third party. Um, Eline later called the action extensive and damaging sabotage. And the impact here for Tesla was a very expensive lawsuit, reputation damage, and we have not seen yet, but certainly impact to the stolen IP. And this impact will certainly um, come to fruition a bit, a bit later. The next case here is something that happened at Shopify this year. Um, the media reports that there were two rogue employees that legitimately had access to customer transaction records and stole all of those customer records, um, transaction records. Um, and what's, you know, what's you think about like, what's the harm with transaction records? Well, typically these records include payment information um, and Shopify didn't confirm that they lost credit card numbers or not but multiple shoppers during that time um, also claimed that they suffered fraudulent credit card charges with the breach time window. So the impact to, um, for Shopify wasn't necessarily just for their consumers, but Shopify lost merchants, their stock dropped um, due to this particular news. So certainly a big impact for the company. This last example that I wanted to share is one that actually took place in my company at Cofree 2. And I mentioned before that insider risk programs, they need to cover both malicious and non-malicious actions. And this example um, of our company's data here was, was put at risk from a non-malicious action. So as part of my internal insider risk program, what we do is we identify, we go through and we have visibility to all of our employees' actions. And we identified a large amount of data moving from personal machines to personal, I'm sorry, corporate machines to personal iCloud drives. And this was for two of our senior level employees. Um, because my company has decided to use only Box and G Drive as our corporate solutions, um, this iCloud data movement was certainly a, a very big red flag. So we dug in and upon further review, this, is, this was not an intentional data exfiltration action. The employee's device itself was misconfigured to allow this sync to take place in the first place. Um, but this is a really great example of the level of visibility we think customers and companies across need um, to address this, um, this risk to data exfiltration. And I had two examples that I uh, wanted to bring up um, for, for this particular talk was in, uh, in related to, both related to hacktivism. Now hacktivism, for those of you who are listening and may not be familiar, is when someone hacks for social or political purpose. And when we say hack in this case, it also means insider threat risk, right? So it does a type of a militia, uh, something that causes malicious action and malicious harm. So, um, in 2017, uh, during Trump's presidency, uh, an employee at Twitter, without the company's permission, deleted the president's uh, account for a very visible 11 minutes. Um, and that obviously put Twitter in the headlines and had a lot of cleanup uh, to do as a function of that. And this, is, uh, this was totally in line with the employee's access level um, however, it did not have the level of controls or authentication that Twitter has since put in. Uh, one of the examples that taught Twitter how to, how to think about insider threat in a little bit of a, if a different capacity. And most recently, um, at the very beginning of January, an angry staffer at the State Department decided to update the State Department's website uh, reflecting their opinion of, of Trump's term and um, saying that it ended several weeks earlier or several weeks earlier than it actually did. So again, this might seem funny or, or something that's worth putting in, like, um, putting uh, social media or, or um, news attention on. However, uh, this is, something that may be an incremental change, but in the back end, who knows what a disgruntled employee with this type of access might also be interested in doing and might be able to do. So um, all of these 
are relatively easy changes to restore. However, both of them have put Twitter and State Department on headlines and, uh, and are maybe symptoms of much larger insider threat things happening in their organizations uh, related to hacktivism and politically motivated actions. So when we think about the fact that there are these insider threats in our organizations, the next question is, well, what do I do about it? Yes, I understand that 2020 is, is introducing an additional risk to my organization, but what can I as a security practitioner or as a CISO do going back to my organization and to address this threat? Well, there's two components that we want to talk through with you next. The first is employee risk, and the second is data risk, the two elements of insider risk. So let's start with employee risk first. Uh, so in all of those case studies that we just walked through with you, we heard that there it were employees making risky decisions in an organization, sometimes knowingly, sometimes unknowingly. But very few organizations that I work with today have the ability to answer which employees are making risky decisions, what decisions are they making, and how often. And why that is incredibly important is if we are able to answer this question today, then we can have a sense of control of where we need to be investing our time, resources, monitoring, controls, education, um, any type of intervention to start addressing this risk. Now, this is primarily for when we look at the unintentional insider threat, because when we look at malicious, it's often a lot more calculated and um, doesn't always necessarily have the pre-flags that, that the accidental uh, might have. But I have some great news to, to share with you all around how you might even start on understanding which employees are making your risky decisions. And that is the fact that the past decisions of our employees are one of the best predictors we can use for future actions. There was a fantastic study done in 2015 by Dr. Caputo around phishing susceptibility and spear phishing as one example of a risk. And her work found that if an employee clicked on one spear phishing out of three, it was a very high indication that they were going to click on the future second and third. So how we deal with one risk in one point of time is an excellent map of our mindsets around how we think about security and the decisions we make in the future. So let's look at our employees' risks as a function of all of the behaviors and decisions they make on your network. We can take a look at how proactive someone is around security. Do they store strong passwords? Do they use MFA? Or are they on the other end where they're navigating to malicious sites, downloading malware, as JD was mentioning, accidentally, but oversharing, not being mindful about the permissions they're setting in their accounts, but regularly making small but risky trade-offs that do not benefit security that helps us understand that this is a risky employee. Now, the good news is that this data exists in most of your environments already. These are related to the logs for your um, security solutions that you've likely invested in from endpoint to email security to CASB solutions. And so instead of just thinking of them as incident logs, think of those logs as security decisions that employees are making that you can use to learn from around where your risks are growing or, or existing in your organization. And in doing so, you are able to be able to map the risk for not just a department and not just to someone with a particular access type, but to every individual based on what kind of decisions you are seeing them um, do well or poorly. And why that is incredibly exciting and a really um, valuable way to think about managing this risk going forward is that it helps us think about how we architect our permissioning going forward as well. And, um, as we all may be familiar with, the prevalence of work from home environments has given rise to zero trust security, uh, which is, is basically allowing, um, is making sure that we're not granting access to a user to particular permit to data or to applications until that identity has been verified. And now the things that can go into that identity to determine who that individual is can be um, a variety of things, including with the user's location, the time of day, but their risk reputation and what we just talked about is a valuable component that can go into the passport of understanding of whether or not we should be allowing 
users access to specific types of data and permissioning. And that is a very effective way of actioning what we know about employee risk and helping us mitigate uh, and minimize the blast radius of risky decisions that an employee might be able to make in the future. So I'm going to take it the, the next mile. So we talked a lot about knowing your employee risk, and I want to just give you a couple ideas and thought provoking things that you can take back to your organization around knowing your data risk. So as Masha set the stage for knowing employee risk, um, we, we also have to do the combination of employee risk and employee risk indicators tied to our data at our organization and data access. And this is where it all kind of comes together. So first off, you all have to evaluate the impacts that we talked about earlier in the presentation to your company. Are we all using more and more collaboration software? Um, do you have a high workforce turnover? For most of us, we're certainly in a spot where we have more and more remote workers and we are all part of this crazy 2020 year um, and into 2021 year and we all have increased stress throughout our organization. Organization. So once we evaluate all of these impact factors on our organization, I'd encourage you all to evaluate your data exfiltration visibility across the organization. So it's really important that each of us understand where our exfiltration points are and where we need additional monitoring and additional visibility. In one of our latest surveys, our, our respondents indicated that the top exfiltration is email followed by printing, um, external hard drives. That's not gonna be the exact same for all of you, but getting a sense of like, where is important data leaving um, my organization is a really important question to answer. Um, the, the other thing that I, I would challenge you on is um, what, you know, tie back to what Masha talked about, like what are our users doing with your data? Um, are users using the corporate storage locations that you've provided them or are they using something else because they like it more, they like the UI more? Um, in another one of our, study, our studies, we also found that 37% of our of employees responded that they are using unsanctioned cloud sharing technology. So they're essentially not using the corporate sharing technology, but they're flipping to a different one. And um, the thing that we all have to ask ourselves as security professionals is, do we have visibility to that? Um, and do we have the right monitoring to all those different extra exfiltration locations um, so that we can assess risk for ourselves? So as we talk about what's next here, um, I, I want, we, we covered a ton, but in summary, we want to emphasize the importance of first knowing your employee risk and then also knowing your data risk. And we thought we would wrap this up with two really simple questions um, for you to think through. And the first one is like, what types of mistakes are on the rise internally? And Masha talked a lot about this. Um, what, what are the employees in my organization doing today? And what are those non-malicious mistakes that are happening? Um, somebody syncing their device to iCloud unintentionally is a really great example of that. And then secondly, wh what is my risk to data? Where do I actually have those data exfiltration points? And do I have the right visibility and the right monitoring on those different points. And so as we as we close, um, we also want to leave you with um, a few things to think about related to employee risk and data risk. And these are almost considerations as you ask those first two questions and you start to solve this problem. First, make sure that you plan your investments in technology and programs that really embrace where your employees want to work. Um, I think we can probably all agree that this thing called remote work is here to stay. And we all need to consider how do we get visibility without what we used to have, without the office, without the network perimeter. Secondly, make sure you factor in how your employees want to work. Um, we know that collaboration solutions do pose a risk to data, but we also know that they're a really needed 
part of our business today. Um, our teams, my teams love collaboration solutions. They drive efficiencies, innovations. Um, they essentially help get work done faster. And these solutions are really here to stay. So we need to make sure that we plan investments, not to block these collaboration technologies, but instead allow the security team to have visibility to these solutions. Um, one staggering statistic that I'd share is that 51% of security security leaders receive daily or weekly complaints about blocking legitimate work. Um, I, I don't want to be one of those security teams. Like I definitely want to enable my team to do the work that they need to do so that I don't have employees go around me and I can still have the visibility and the monitoring that I need. And the last point that I wanted to share with you all is rethinking insider risk as this big headline that is always a lawsuit. Insider risk can show up in our organizations as a thousand small decisions that our employees were making or data leaving our network. Each of those can be lessons that teach us how we defend ourselves against a much larger event. And as we talked about with the Code 42 example or Twitter learning from access to, um, to certain types of permissions like deleting accounts without a secondary control, each of those instead of being seen as failures, use those for opportunities to apply small changes and evolve your, the security posture of your organization to be able to withstand something much larger. And uh, encourage every part of your security team to take these as learning opportunities and evolve as a security team, because that's how we we get better. We we don't we don't plan for the uh, the future theoretical thing. We learn about the things that are happening today and help us to to get to where we actually want to go in the future. And with that, we're looking forward to seeing you all in our interactive session for questions.